weeks. Okay. So you've got almost uh, a full two, or a little, a little over actually, a full two weeks before we'll go to take the test in this particular class, or this particular unit. Um, like I said, it does slow down a little bit. There's only two chapters over the next two weeks. So we're a little bit better. Um, we'll do a little less uh, direct instruction, direct lecture, and a little bit more uh, sort of activity-based stuff as you talk about this. All right, so our American culture, right, these are basically what we're talking about when we talk about our wide-held beliefs. Okay? And our wide-held beliefs here are going to be stereotypes. In fact, we'll spend the next, like, three weeks stereotyping a lot, okay? which can be fun, but also realize that I'm stereotyping, all right? Because we're talking about sort of broad concepts, and we're talking about generalizations, right? And that's really what stereotyping is. You might want to come use this one over here. It works a little bit better. All right. So, Americans, we believe in liberty, right? We recognize that that's like one of the most foundational aspects of American politics, period, right? The United States is great because we have freedom. Okay, number one concept there, freedom. All right, sorry, hold on. Uh, Second, we believe, or, or for the longest time, we have had this belief or this ideology in what we call rugged individualism. Okay? And rugged individualism is this idea or this belief that we, the individual, are the ones who, we, the individual, are the ones who are sort of responsible for our own successes, our own welfare, and okay? that we do what we want in order to ensure that we individually are successful. Now, is that an accurate portrayal of Americans in this day and age? Probably not anymore, but we still believe in this idea because the alternative is you know, we're just coddled and babied and the government takes care of everything for us. Okay? But as the world becomes more and more complex, we tend to turn to the government for more and more solutions. Alright? Believe in equality. Right? Basic premise here. We've already talked about this, right? Do we really believe in equality? No. No. Right? If I ask every one of you in this room who's the best person in this room, every single one of you should have the exact same answer. Me. Not like me, but yourself. Okay? So it's the equality of opportunity that we believe in. Right? And we believe in political equality more than we believe in economic equality. We're just going to talk about broad equality. Right? Everybody's vote counts the same, right? No, not true. It isn't. You'll learn that. You'll figure that out. Okay. If everybody's vote counted the same, would Donald Trump be president of the United States right now? He would. Okay. And the electoral college system is a whole different thing that we'll talk about at a different time. But even if you take the electoral college and the presidential system out of it, right? Let's just say for the sake of argument that you're a Democrat sitting here in this room right now. And does your vote count as much as a Republican vote come November? Not really. Okay? Because Pete Olson, who is your representative, is going to continue to get reelected in this district because it is a Republican-dominated district. He's the Republican. Right? I mean... That happens in politics, so it doesn't necessarily always mean that your vote is equal, but you have the same access. What? Well, the thing with the electoral college, there's wasted votes in each of the Democratic power holes. When you win the vast majority of the vote, um, it doesn't account. Well, so if 
percent of the people are Democrat in that state, you're still only going to get 55 electoral votes. Correct. That's why you can win the popular vote and lose. No, right. No, no. That's there's. You're absolutely right. There's no. There's no way around the understanding of the argument that the electoral and college means that people. The vote electoral are not college is so people in Alaska, their opinions and views. People in states like Montana, their opinions and views. Where there's less people, they can be heard. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And that's the reason that the system was set up in that manner. Okay. Right. I mean, I'm. We'll actually talk in a, in a week or so, or a little bit over a week, we'll talk about whether or not the Electoral College is an outdated system that we need to get rid of. That's why getting rid of it is wrong. Well, and we'll have that conversation, right? I mean, obviously, that's you're already making your opinion known. That's something that, that people can determine for themselves, right? But that is one of the reasons or one of the basic premises behind the Electoral College is to ensure that largely populated states like California, New York, Texas, Florida cannot sort of dominate or <laughs> tyrannize small states like Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, whatever. You can sell a package to all the big cities and just cater to the big cities and win the vote. Correct. Yeah. Probably. All right. Uh, we believe in the American dream. Do we understand what this do you guys actually under this? This is something you've probably been told a lot, right? The American dream. Do you actually understand what the American dream is? Now, 
Does that just necessarily mean economics? Okay. Let's take somebody like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. When he tried to create a better life for his son, what did that mean? Did that mean that he had to get rich so his son was rich? In reality, it had nothing to do with economics, did it? Okay. So when you define the American dream in that way, do you understand how that is sort of all-encompassing in and everybody can get that? Because even if you don't want to have children, right, you want a better life than what your parents had. Okay. To where literally I heard an interview a week and a half ago with a guy in the NFL, right, who makes millions of dollars a year to play a game. And said that he would never let his son play in the NFL. Because he would want something better for him. And now, some of you are like, what is better than millions of dollars for playing a game? All right? But think about some of the negative physical aspects that come with that. Right? Threats of CTE. Okay? People to end up with bad knees, bad backs, bad, all kinds of stuff. Alright? So, there is an arbitrary nature to the idea of the American dream, but we understand what it's right, what it, what it, what it relates to that we, we cover it in that regard. Okay, we believe in democracy, right? So, everybody's vote counts. And we believe in what we call civic duty. What is that? Here and Nicholas is here. John, raise your hand, John. So you have a duty, you have a civic duty to vote, you have a civic duty to engage politically, you have a civic duty to serve on a jury, right? Kaylee. opportunity to serve on jury duty. I'm going to tell you right now, most most of you, and and I personally think this is a little sad, okay, Mo most of you are going to the first time that you are summoned to jury duty, you're going to sit in that little room while you wait on them to call your number, and you're going to be like, damn, how can I get out of this? What can I say? How do I sound crazy enough that some attorney is like, nah, nah, man, I don't want him on a jury. No. Right? Or you're sitting there going, man, can I use that religiously? God said, thou shalt not judge, man. I'm like, I can't judge nobody because Jesus told me I could. Can I get out of jury duty that way? Guys, okay, you're going to do that. All right? Which is, which is sad. Okay? Um. Because ultimately, do you, you realize what ends up happening then? Who, who gets left on jury duty? The people that weren't smart enough to figure out a way out of it. Okay. Now, let me just think, let me just ask you this question for a second. Let's let's Christian. Let's just say somebody somebody puts you on trial for your life because they said you murdered somebody. You didn't do it, man. You know you didn't do it. Okay. Do you want a bunch of idiots? On a jury, or do you want intelligent people that could actually understand evidence? Um, probably intelligent people. Probably intelligent people. Oh, I don't want you on the. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So understand that when you do get summoned for jury duty, right? I would, I would hope that you would take it serious. Right? I would hope that you wouldn't just immediately try to figure some way out of it. Because civic duty is important, okay? And political awareness is important, okay? Civic duty is the exact same thing with voting. Because there's nothing more irritating than, than watching people come out of a polling location, right? Because I'm, I'm, it happened eight years ago when I was living in North Carolina, 
okay, where you would, you would see like a 50-year-old black person come out of a polling location, they'd stop and interview him. Uh, who'd you vote for? I voted for Obama. Why? Because he's black. Well, who'd you vote for four years ago? I ain't never voted in my life. Okay? <laughs> and I've heard that interview on television. And I guarantee you right now, I guarantee you that there are people who went and cast a vote in November that went and voted for Donald Trump because he's white. Because he's made. And if you would ask them, who'd you vote for four years ago then? I never voted in my life. Okay? Uneducated voting is, is highly problematic. All right? So... While you have a civic duty to vote, you also have a civic duty to understand what you're doing. Okay? So there's a, an expectation of, of an intellectual vote. All right? And we'll get into that a little bit more when we get into voting. Okay? Part of our basic understanding of American politics, we don't trust the government. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah. How many of you trust Donald Trump? How many of you trust... Uh, Chuck Schumer. How many of you know who Chuck Schumer is? One person. He is the Senate Minority Leader. Okay. He took over for Harry Reid, who just retired. So I, I'll let you go through some of the charts and some of the political cartoons in here on your own. Okay, this basically is talking about what is or is not sort of an obligation of a citizen, right? So voting, okay, on the bright side, only nine people think it's a personal preference, right? Most people say it's at least somewhat important, if not it's an absolute obligation. Okay, now, we're going to get into a term here. This is a vocabulary term. Right, which I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, will be on a vocab quiz. Just I'll go, I'll go ahead and guarantee you that that word is going to show up on a vocab quiz. Okay. There's different types of efficacy, but efficacy is something that you need to understand. Okay. Because efficacy is actually about your ability to understand. Okay. So, political efficacy is the capability to understand and influence politics. Do you understand what is going on politically, and can you help shape the course of political events moving forward? Okay. Now, political efficacy actually breaks down into what we call internal efficacy and external efficacy. Internal efficacy is your ability to understand. Do you get what's going on? Okay. Anybody in here think they have a high internal political efficacy? Nobody? Nobody understands what goes on in the world politically. Well, we can't see it. That, that's external. So, it, so here's the thing. Once you put the little modifiers in here of internal and external, it changes this a little bit. Internal is capacity to understand. External is influence. And Christian actually brings up a really good point because there are actually a number of Americans who would tell you that they have a high internal political efficacy. They get what's going on. But they have an incredibly low external political efficacy because they don't feel like they can change anything. They can't influence anything. That even when they go and cast their vote, that ultimately their vote is not going to go and change anything. Okay? Because these people ultimately believe, and a lot of Americans believe, that it doesn't matter who you voted for. They're all going to suck. Nobody's going to do anything that actually makes things better for us. All right? So this is the idea of efficacy. So internal is understanding. External is impacting what actually happens. Okay? This is relatively stable for the last 70 years. External political efficacy has continued to go down further and further, which means people think they're just as intelligent as they've always been, but that their voice or their opinion, their influence matters less. All right? Political tolerance, that's really an abstract idea at this point because we, we say we believe in political tolerance. Most Americans do not. And it's, it's sad, but most...
most Americans, when they go home and they want to watch the news, they if they're already if they already identify themselves as conservative Republicans, they flip on Fox News and just swallow whole everything that Fox said. And if they identify themselves as liberal, democratic, ideologically people, right, they go flip on CNN and just believe everything CNN says wholeheartedly. Right? I will challenge you right now today that if you think that you are a liberal, go watch Fox News. And if you think that you're a conservative, go watch CNN or go read the New York Times and challenge yourself to truly understand the other position because it's not until you truly understand the other position that you would even know how to defend your own. Right? Because if you go back and you just look at the little ridiculously stupid controversy from Saturday, because Donald Trump had his little press secretary run out there, there were more people there than would showed up for Obama. And, and people just cropped the photos to make it look like they were empty. Okay? And then I literally had students tell me yesterday, well, no, the, the, the photos that CNN was showing, those were from like an hour and a half before the actual inauguration. That's why there was so much open space. Right? Sure, that's what Fox News told you. That's not accurate. Okay? In reality, it doesn't matter. This, 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 is, this is like the whole 45 minutes of just stupidity we heard in the presidential uh, the primary season where Rubio and Trump spent 45 minutes arguing about the size of that man's hands. They just made all Americans dumb. Right? That's exactly <laughs> what's going on right now. Okay? Pragmatism, this means that we're less ideological than what we used to be. I would tell you, I actually think that currently this is beginning to shift as well. I think we're actually beginning to become more ideological again but actually in a negative manner, right? So when you talk about pragmatism, what we're really talking about is the idea to sort of compromise your ideals or your values in order to get things done. I think we're becoming more ideological, but we're becoming more extreme in our ideologies and less willing to work with one another, okay? which is why you see Republicans and Democrats that, that I mean, literally, there are Republicans who are like, we're going to repeal Obamacare. And replace it with Obamacare, but it's a new name. Like, that's absurd. You're going to spend all that time and energy just to take the man's name off of it because he was a Democrat, and so you can't, you can't have that. Because can't, Democrats can't have a good idea. What? Are you saying you're not going to enjoy Trump care? <laughs> I, I, at this point, I don't know what Trump care is. I, like like most of what Trump has done at this point, he's been very vague about a lot of things. They well, at this point you have like six different yeah, but you have six different senators that have come up with six separate ideas. That I mean, literally, as was, was eating breakfast this morning, two Republicans are like, "We're going to repeal Obamacare," but states where it's working well, it's the state that wants to keep Obamacare, they can keep it then you're not actually repealing it. So stop pretending like you got to repeal it if it's working in some state because it has Obama's name on it, and so you just can't be okay with that. Like, that, the, the, the pettiness in politics, and look, I'm not going to tell you that you're kidding yourself if you think only Republicans are petty. Okay? Because the Democrats do the exact same thing. The Democrats sat there for, for nine months and told the Republicans, you're terrible people. How could you not vote on Merrick Garland? Terrible people. Now Chuck Schumer's going like, yeah, no, we're not voting on anybody either. Yeah, you lost. Now you're going to do exactly what the Republicans did, and yet you complained about what they did for nine months. Okay, political socialization. This is how you get your, uh, your beliefs, your opinions. This is how you become a political person. Right? Anybody want to guess the number one agent for politicalization? What do you think? Genetics. Your parents. Your parents. Not necessarily genetics. Genetics makes it seem like, like, like you're born.
Like, like the baby pops out and be like, oh, chromosome 26 says you're going to be a Democrat. There, for the record, there is no chromosome 26. It only goes up to 26. I know something about science. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. That's pretty much all I know. All right. The family is definitely the strongest, right? It is absolutely the strongest agent that you're going to have in terms of your political association or socialization. If your mom and dad are hardcore Republicans, you're probably going to be a hardcore Republican. Okay? Conversely, if they're hardcore Democrats, same sort of concept. All right? Um, specifically in terms of party affiliation. Right? So party affiliation actually matters even more in this day and age, but the <coughs> ideologies are a little less now, okay? Which is why or how you end up with some blurring of the lines with somebody like Clinton who is staunchly Democrat, yet Clinton was all about just using the military when she was Secretary of State to go kill everybody. And that is not a Democratic position. That's a Republican position, okay? So there are times where you'll see sort of shifts in the line between liberties and racial issues and things like that. Okay? They'll tell you that it's fairly equal between your mom and your dad. That's not necessarily always true, though. If, you, if your parents are separate okay, and you have a closer relationship with one versus the other, like you're really you're a, a daddy's girl or whatever, okay, or you're a mama's boy or a mama's girl or what, like if you are, I don't, no, 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 I don't mean it in like a derogatory term, but I mean like you have a, a significantly closer relationship to one parent versus the other, especially in this day and age where you have single family or single parent homes, okay, then that parent that you have the closer relationship with is generally going to be more influential in your political association, right? Mama's boy, like a derogatory term or something? No. <laughs> My daughter's a daddy's girl. My daughter's she is a baby. It's okay to say what you're Okay, uh, schools are a political socialization agent. For the most part, schools function in terms of providing you with information or a basic understanding of your sort of obligations, right? So, civic duties, patriotism, things like that, okay? For the most part, and I guarantee you that this is a, gen this, again, I told you we're going to talk in broad generalizations for the most part over the next couple of weeks. For the most part, government classes do not change your political orientation much. Good government teachers really shouldn't, okay? That being said, there are bad government teachers in the world that are going to sit here and just rail about how good one, one party is or how bad the other party is, okay? Hopefully, when you walk out of this class in, in May, right, you'll be like, wow, Coach Baker just hated them all, so I don't know what he thinks. <laughs> now, um, college students tend to be more liberal uh, than the general population. Okay? Believe it or not, when you go to college, I don't care how staunchly Republican you think you are. Okay. Statistics show that when you get out of college, you'll be a little bit more liberal. I'm not saying you're going to swing all the way to the other side and be like, I love Hillary now. But you're going to at least be like, damn. All right. I can kind of understand what she thought about this one ID. All right. The more prestigious the school, the more liberal it tends to be. Okay. So when you're talking about your, uh, your ID, League type schools. Um, you could think of the same thing that's probably easier for you to understand with like the University of Texas. Right? That's the most prestigious public university here in the state. And what do we know about Austin? Very liberal. Okay? So even like where I went to school, the University of North Carolina, it was, I mean, I always found it funny because you know, I'd meet like freshmen there, they're like, because they came from like the mountains of North Carolina. I used to live right outside of Berkeley, California, which is the most liberal place on the face of the earth. And I was stationed in Alameda. And I would look at these people and be like, y'all have no idea what liberal is. This is not liberal. Like, not even close. All right? Based on what you major in, that 
actually influences whether or not you are liberal versus conservative as well. Okay, so when you're looking at college, liberal arts majors tend to be more liberal. That would be English, language, uh, history, sociology, anthropology, anything like that. Okay? Natural or physical sciences, biology, chemistry, things like that. Math tend to be more Republican-based or conservative-based. Alright? Okay, religion. Believe it or not, not all religious people identify as conservative. And okay? If you're Protestant, you're typically a conservative. Catholics are actually traditionally more liberal or more democratic, although that is beginning to shift slightly. And you do have a number of Catholics like Tim Kaine. Do we remember him? He was Hillary Clinton's vice presidential candidate. Tim Kaine is a Catholic Democrat who basically was opposed to abortion, but he just wouldn't kind of tell you that publicly, right? Because his Catholic faith says abortion is wrong, but his political ideology says I can't tell somebody what to do, right? So they're in conflict with one another, and you'll see that from time to time when it comes to this, right? Uh, the Jewish faith, they are even more democratic or more staunchly democratic than what uh, Catholics are. Race, again, we're stereotyping. White people, conservative, right? Black people, liberal. Hispanic people, liberal. Unless you're Cuban. Right? <laughs> Cubans, are, Cubans are Republican. Okay? Asians, definitely Republican. Okay. Income. The more you make, the more conservative you are. The less you make, generally the more liberal you are. Okay. Uh, let's see. Gender. Okay. Obviously, men tend to be more. Uh, I don't want to say men tend to be more conservative. Women do tend to be more liberal. All right. So there is there is a there is an aspect of that now. I do want you to understand that with all of this, okay, there are always going to be cross pressures, right? Because what happens if you are a black woman who happens to identify as Baptist, right? What do you do? Okay. What happens if you're a rich black woman who identifies as Baptist? Right? Are you going to be a Republican or a Democrat at that point? So there's always varying sort of or conflicting uh, agents of socialization, right? And so when we do this, when we talk about this, we, we, we really do talk about broad sort of stereotypes. And okay? so realize that, right? And some of these, as you'll, you'll begin to realize, should be even a little bit more confusing or more convoluted to you. Because I just told you that, that college-educated people tend to be what? Liberal. Rich people tend to be conservative. How many dumb rich people you know? Or uneducated rich people you know? Not many. All right, let's not include Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian. Okay? I'm not talking about people that inherited their wealth, or I'm still not 100% certain what Kim Kardashian did to get hers. Okay? I don't know, I still can't, I, I asked my wife, right, I'm like, why is that woman famous? I don't, because her daddy, like, defended O.J. Simpson when he was on murder trials, like, I don't, it was like a collection. yeah, I don't know, okay, so, you'll realize that, that, that obviously, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to become wealthy, okay, the more wealthy you are, the more likely you are to be conservative, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to be liberal, so obviously, there are always competing factors, all right, Go ahead and pack up. We'll stop there. We're going to get to do an activity tomorrow where you get to be the